grace and mercy and peace are yours from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. The words of scripture for us to consider today are found in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward mankind appeared, he saved us, not by righteous works that we did ourselves, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs in keeping with the hope of eternal life. This is the word of our Lord. Ah, dearest Jesus, holy child, make thee a bed soft undefiled, within my heart that it may be a quiet chamber kept for thee. Amen. Dear friends in, in Christ Jesus, our baptismal font is uh, covered today by the table for the Lord's altar for the sacrament. But the sacrament of baptism is still present for you every time you come to worship in God's house. The font is here up front. In most of the Lutheran churches where you worship, it is visible because baptism is an important reason to celebrate the great things that God does in baptism. And I recall, even as a young child in worship services, maybe you recall, as a child, seeing a baptism. And I recall sitting in the back of church and craning my neck, trying to get a good view of what was going on up in front as we were seated, sometimes between, behind a taller person. So oftentimes when we have a baptism here, though they are few, I'll invite the children of the congregation to go ahead and take a front row seat so that they can have a good view of the baptism. It's fitting that we celebrate baptisms. In fact, I recall even, not recall, I know one good pastor friend of mine, not too far away from here, uh, was at seminary together with him. And he has a much younger congregation than we have here at Abiding Savior. And it's very often that I see his social media posts with a picture of a baptism. And his caption is the same whenever there's a baptism, he says, it's always a good day when there's a baptism. How true. Very true is that. And so as we think about that on this day, when we think about Jesus' baptism, let's take an opportunity to answer the question, what is baptism? As we answer that question, we'll maybe start out with Martin Luther's very simple words of explanation. As he said, first, what is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but it is water used by God's command and connected with God's word. So Jesus tells us to baptize. But then, what does this baptism do for us? Martin Luther went on to explain that in the second part. Baptism works forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare. Martin Luther, when he explained that what baptism does for us, he used words from Titus. These words from Titus chapter 3 about the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit because baptism works forgiveness of sins. But maybe before I talk more about our baptisms, we have to take a step aside and ask, what about Jesus' baptism? Why was Jesus baptized if he didn't need forgiveness of sins? Right? Jesus Christ, true God, holy, begotten of the Father from eternity, why would he need to be baptized? And in fact, John the Baptist from um, the, the Gospel of, of uh, Luke, uh, actually from Matthew, indicated, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Well, Jesus is indicating that he is, has come to do the Father's will. It is necessary that I be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And all that righteousness that he is fulfilling 
is really presented for us in these words from Titus, or the letter to Titus. So the Apostle Paul wrote these words uh, to young pastor Titus, and maybe it's a young pastor who is eagerly looking forward to his first baptism. Or maybe he's a pastor who's, uh, who, who's done a few baptisms already and has already started his social media posting of the day, however writing it in, uh, on, on pieces of paper that he handed out, or just saying the words, it's always a good day when there's a baptism. But this is what he says to young Pastor Titus. The Apostle Paul says this in his third chapter. When the kindness and love of God our Savior toward mankind appeared, he saved us. Not by righteous works that he, we did ourselves, but because of his mercy. If you see those first two verses in the text, I'm going to focus in on three big words. Maybe not big in length, not big in the number of syllables, but they are definitely big words, doctrinally. Big words with meaning for us. The first one is kindness. Whose kindness? The kindness of God. When the kindness of God appeared. Well, before we talk about whose kindness is talking about, just think for a moment, what's the definition of kindness that you come up with? A few of us today, if you wanted to share, I'd let you, a good example of kindness. Maybe it's the grade school teacher. Maybe it's your mother. Maybe it's a neighbor who had cookies when you were over there to play or nearby play and came out even though her kids weren't out there. She brought you cookies to the neighborhood. It's some act of kindness. It's generosity. It's being good to someone. Well, if we're talking about the kindness of God, He is God our Savior. And when that kindness appeared, we think about Christmas. Which is why we're not far removed from Christmas when we study and, and learn about this baptism of Jesus. Right? His baptism indicates um, what is the next step in his life? As Jesus is baptized, God was making his kindness appear to the world. His kindness, while his face didn't appear, God the Father's voice most certainly did, right? You are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. God the Father was pleased with his son because he was revealing the kindness of God to the world. That kindest act that God would do. Giving his own son to be the world's savior. And this kindness of God, our savior, appeared when Jesus Christ came to this earth. And that's where God revealed that kindness for sinners. But kindness has a word that goes with it. Kindness and love. And if you're a scholar of the Bible, and maybe even in sermons you've heard me refer to the Greek word for love, that is agape, that agape love of God, which means it's an independent love. It's not based on anything in us. I'm going to surprise you maybe if you don't know the Greek, but the Greek word agape is not the word for love here. In this verse, the other word, philos, where we get Philadelphia from, or philanthropy, that fill us is a brotherly love, the love of friends, the love of someone who puts his arm around you and walks step by step with you and shares a lot in common with you. You see, interestingly, God uses the word fill us, that love of a friendship when he talks about these verses regarding the work of Jesus at his baptism. That's exactly what Jesus explained to John the Baptist when John said, you know, I don't need to baptize you. You don't have any sins. You should, you should baptize me. But Jesus said, no. I need to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, in my baptism, I'm putting my arm around you. And I'm walking this world as your substitute, doing every righteous thing that you are commanded to do, I am doing it in your place. Jesus was our substitute 
in baptism and declared by God to be that substitute as he began his ministry here publicly declared by those words from the Heavenly Father, this is my son whom I love and I'm well pleased with him. So you catch the first two words, kindness, right, and love. The third word comes at the very end of verse 5, the word mercy. If you look at that, but because of his mercy, why did he save us? That's mercy. Well, what does mercy mean? I'll give you a moment to think about that. You can shout out an answer if you want. Mercy? Mercy is similar to love, similar to the agape love, but a little bit of a different aspect. It's kindness, but to someone who is in a despicable and despairing situation. I've oftentimes explained that the word mercy would be loving a stray dog. But not just loving a stray dog that showed up on your backyard and is so cute. But a stray dog that is full of fleas and all mangy and infected. And not only that, when you try to feed the dog, it bites you. Mercy is still showing kindness and love to something like that. Mercy is how God viewed you and me in our despicable situation as sinners. That's why he saved us. Not because of any righteous thing you or I had done. Jesus, at his baptism, was revealing the mercy of God who had come for that very purpose. It's that motivational, uh, the motivation that God had for sending the Savior to this world. And so, as we move on now, we've spoken about why Jesus was baptized. We get back to Titus' words moving forward, explaining as we see in verse 5 and following, what occurs for us in our baptisms. That he saved us, not by righteous works that we did for ourselves, but because of his mercy. In effect, what else could rescue us? That, that kindness, that, that love, that mercy of God. Because when I think about that word mercy, I see my failures. I see my failures to love someone like God love. I see the times when someone was in too impoverished a situation for me to think I had any way that I could help. I just even gave up. But not only that, when I think about my kindness towards others, I feel most guilty when I wind up failing to be kind to someone that I naturally should be kind to. My spouse, my children, people close to me, it should be easy to be kind to them. But how many times do I just get racked with guilt because I failed to show that kindness? Thank God that we are saved by His mercy. Not by any of the righteous acts that we had done. Not by any of the righteous kind things or merciful deeds that I personally have done because I definitely could not have done enough. And this point about not earning it, not having done enough to earn God's mercy or love or kindness, that's where the next verse introduces baptism. Where Paul brings up baptism for young Pastor Titus. He saved us, it says. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Pouring out that love, that kindness, that mercy of God abundantly upon us. Again, because of His love. No earning on my part. Totally a gift of God coming from His merciful heart. And as He gives us that washing of renewal. It is forgiveness. It is saving us from the guilt that I feel for failing to be kind to others. The guilt that you feel for those same failures or whatever failures they may be. Those sins are forgiven because of the waters in baptism. 
and God's pronouncement about what that water and the Word of God does in baptism for you and for me. Sins fully forgiven. And when we have that forgiveness, there, there is a powerful change uh, that occurs. There's, there's a new spiritual life through the power of the Holy Spirit that works in, in baptism. It's, as Titus uh, is told, it's a washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Recognize, this is not uh, reincarnation, not taking on flesh again, born a second time in the flesh. This is the spiritual birth, a spiritual regeneration. That means that when I have been baptized, I have been covered by the waters of Christ. And not only the waters, but the pronouncement of forgiveness and Christ's righteousness. Many Lutheran hymn writers and Christian hymn writers just in general have pictured that specific thing about baptism. Describing it as, a, as being covered with Christ's holiness. But it's not a symbolic thing. It is actually the gift given to us. One hymn writer said, Jesus, your blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Right? We are clothed in this righteousness of Jesus, this perfection, this holiness that he lived, because recognize that Jesus walked his entire life as our brother, never once failing in his acts of kindness, not only to those who were closest to him, but even to the strangers the ones in deepest need. Jesus was perfect in that, so he could give that righteousness to you and to me. God also says that that new life, that new clothing that I have in baptism, gives me strength, gives you strength, so we live all of our days like we're children of God. So we have the goal to set aside those works of darkness, Set aside those selfish, unkind actions, but live more like Christ. Because that is the power that baptism gives us when our sins have been washed away. Martin Luther explained that in his fourth uh, ex part of the explanation about baptism. What does this baptizing uh, with water mean for our daily lives? It means that our old Adam with his evil deeds and desires should be drowned by daily contrition and repentance and die. And that day by day a new man should arise as from the dead to live in righteousness and purity now and forever. In effect, when the waters and the word the water with the word of God has cleaned us in baptism. We want to stay clean. We want, don't, don't want to dirty our, our spiritual clothing with additional acts of sin. No, that's our desire. But when we do sin against God and fail like we will, we go back to those waters of baptism and remember that God has already forgiven us. That was God's very purpose in that washing with water by the Word and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. That God's purpose for our baptism maybe can even be summarized here in verse 7. So that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs in keeping with the hope of eternal life. We are justified. Another word that we should explain, that that really describes the act that God does by declaring you and me innocent. No longer sinners. That's another word that could be a, a synonym, synonym, synonym with forgiveness, right? We are forgiven. And because we're forgiven, justified, there's nothing that prevents us from receiving the gifts that the children of God receive. The inheritance, that is the hope of eternal life that we have. And that was this whole purpose why God gave us the washing with water through the Word. If you look closely at that final verse of the text, you see the word might, that we might 
become heirs in keeping with the hope of eternal life. A little bit of explanation is there. In, in English, when we see that word might, I think we think of an iffy thing when it's a verb, right? It's a potential. Well, the Greek construction here actually has that word uh, that's translated might has two possibilities. One is potential. The other option is intent or purpose. Really, the Greek construction reveals that it isn't just potential here. It is purpose. That God saved us, God justified us with the purpose that we would be heirs. And there's no doubt about it. There's no maybe involved when you read that word in the English that we might become heirs. Because of that being God's intent and God following through on his intent, you can understand this to be that God justified us so that we would become heirs and that we also have become heirs, this hope of eternal life. Because Jesus himself explained that, uh, uh, that those who believe in him, that gift of faith in him given in baptism, have already crossed over from death to life. That's where you and I find ourselves. Not in an iffy situation, wondering as we age or wondering as we drive our vehicles and perhaps... Uh, get caught in a car accident, a sudden death, or, or, or the aging process leads us each and every day closer towards when this body is no longer going to work. There's no maybe involved in what the gift of God for you truly is. It is being an heir of eternal life. God's promise for you. It's always a good day when there's a baptism. I could be jealous of my brother pastor who probably does uh, at least one baptism a month. I guess if I do three a year, I'm really happy with the makeup of this congregation. But yeah, there's no room for jealousy here. There's no point in jealousy, it, but celebrating. Celebrating as God's kingdom increases through the washing with water through the word. And I don't need to see the baptism of someone else to celebrate. Definitely I will celebrate, but I will celebrate when I remember my own baptism. And you know, celebrating your baptism is even better than celebrating your birthday. I think all of us enjoy a good birthday celebration, not just for kids, but there's a good birthday party even as we advance in age. It's a good reason to celebrate, but what better reason to celebrate as we age than God's promise that we will be heirs of eternal life. Maybe, maybe take an opportunity to find and dig out that old baptism certificate if you don't know when your baptism date was. Or maybe ask your pastor to dig it out of the old church records and have one more day that you can celebrate a wonderful rebirth as Pastor Paul speaks to young Pastor Timothy about the washing with water through the word. So you know what, what happens in baptism. What happens there is that God saves us. Amen.